2015 season. In a few minutes, we're gonna go ahead and get started with uh, a video to kind of kick off, and then we'll get uh, Commissioner Steinbrecher up here uh, to open up with his address for today's uh, media day. Again, at the end of his uh, comments, we will then take questions for Commissioner Steinbrecher, and then approximately about 11.25, 11.30, we will then uh, begin our breakout sessions with coaches and student athletes uh, through different breakout sessions and also as available through, uh, through the tables throughout this room. We encourage you to uh, speak with our guests today, our student athletes and our coaches. Again, build those relationships, get that opportunity for uh, spending time with our individuals as we, as we prepare for the, uh, the 2017 season. So we'll be underway here momentarily. Welcome to the Pro Football Hall of Fame and welcome to joining us for our MAC Football Media Day to kick off the 2017 season. And obviously we are pleased to present uh, the leader of our conference, uh, MAC Commissioner, Dr. John Steinbrecher. Good morning and welcome to the Pro Football Hall of Fame for the Mid-American Conference's 2017 Football Media Day. A special thank you to David Baker and the entire staff of the Football Hall of Fame for their assistance and hospitality during our two days on site. It has been quite a privilege to be here and has provided some special memories for those in attendance. I am pleased to welcome back to the Mid-American Conference the new head coach at Western Michigan University, Tim Lester, and I also hope you will take the opportunity to meet the new Director of Athletics at Central Michigan University, Michael Alford, and at Eastern Michigan University, Scott Weatherby. Both will be excellent additions to our administrative group. We had the great privilege of hosting yesterday former Akron Zip great Jason Taylor, and he spelt, spent a great deal of time with our students participating in Media Day. We look forward to his induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame about a week from now when he will join others from the Mid-American Conference, such as Kent State's Jack Lambert, Miami's Paul Brown and Wee Bubank, Toledo's Emlyn Tunnel, who began his collegiate career at Toledo before joining the Coast Guard during World War II and ultimately finishing his career at Iowa, and George Allen, who graduated from Eastern Michigan University. I appreciate so many of our partners joining us today and will not attempt to recognize all of you. However, I will note that we have a number of bull representatives with us, including Jerry Silverstein, who's head of the Dollar General Bull and our longest running bull partner. And I will single out Michael Kelly, the chief operating officer of the college football playoff, and Wright Waters, the executive director of the Football Bowl Association. Looking back at last year, there is so much to be proud of. Certainly Western Michigan earning an appearance in the Goodyear Cotton Bowl is at the top of that list. The Broncos rose to number 12 in the AP poll before finishing the year at 15. 
Zach Terrell was, from Western Michigan was awarded the William V. Campbell Trophy from the National Football Foundation. It is also known as the Academic Heisman. The Mid-American Conference was one of only two conferences that had two finalists for that award. In 14 of our 23 sports, Mid-American Conference students earned All-America honors. In nine of our 23 sports, we had students earn academic All-America honors. And since I have been here, I have fielded questions and heard lots of speculation about the differences in resources among the autonomous FBS conferences and the non-autonomous FBS conferences. Yet during that same time span, the accomplishments of our teams and individuals have never been greater. Twice in the past five years, a Mid-American Conference team has earned an invitation to a New Year's Six Bowl game. Northern Illinois to the Discover Orange Bowl in 2013, and Western Michigan to the Goodyear Cotton Bowl in 2017. In three of the past five years, a Mid-American Conference student has been selected among the top five draft picks of the NFL draft. Most recently, the number five draft pick for Corey Davis from Western Michigan. Not to mention, the 11 conference students were selected in the 2011 draft, tying a conference record for the most students taken in a single draft. Perhaps not coincidentally, earlier this summer, the NFL Network came out with its list of the top 100 players in the NFL. The Mid-American Conference was the only conference with two players in the top five, those being former Chippewa Antonio Brown at number four and former Bull Khalil Mack at number five. Currently, more than 100 former Mack students are on NFL rosters. While justifiably proud of our student and team accomplishments, accomplishments on the field and in the classroom, I am just as proud of their engagement in their communities. Last year, our 12 member institution student athlete advisory committees banded together to sponsor a bone marrow registry week to honor former Central Michigan football student Derek Nash, whose life was cut short by leukemia in June of 2015. The result was more than 1,500 new people entered the registry. The groups also held their third annual Mental Health Awareness Week and last April conducted a Sexual Violence Prevention Day. If it is true that the definition of a hero is ordinary people doing extraordinary things, I think our students clearly fit that bill and is another example of Maction speaking louder than words. You may notice a slight change in the conference logo patches being worn by students this year. For those students who have earned their degree, their patches will denote that they have graduated. There are a few areas of emphasis for the upcoming season I would like to highlight. Pace of play is an issue we are closely monitoring and have led a national discussion on ways to improve the speed at which games proceed. In our case, the past two years, the Mid-American Conference games have averaged 325, just above the national average. No longer, I hope. We now have a goal. I have asked that we try to get our games in at an average of three hours and 20 minutes. We have studied this extensively, and there is no single reason for this increase in time. There are, in fact, a number of reasons, more scoring, more plays, more passing, penalty administration, television, all of them play a part. And we need to make sure we are doing everything possibly administratively so we don't look to change rules or do anything that changes the fabric of the game. Among other things you will notice is a greater emphasis on the resumption of play following halftime. We expect the field of play to be ready for kickoff when the clock reaches zero. The officials will work to get the ball ready for play quicker and more efficiently after each play. And at a number of our stadiums, we will experiment with an in-stadium television timeout clock to help fans in the stadium know how much time remains until the ball is put back in play when we go to a media break. A major emphasis from the NCAA Football Rules Committee is a new rule to address coaches who enter the field of play to protest an officiating decision. 
coaches who do enter the field of play to question, protest, or otherwise demonstrate disagreement with an officiating decision are subject to an immediate 15-yard penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct. Another rule change with a focus on player safety prohibits players from leaping or hurtling over the line of scrimmage in an effort to block a kick. As a core value, the Mid-American Conference believes in and is committed to diversity, inclusion, and gender equity among its student athletes, coaches, staff, and administrators. We seek to establish and maintain an inclusive culture that fosters equitable participation for student athletes and career opportunities for coaches and administrators. Diversity and inclusion improve the learning environment for all student athletes and enhance excellence within the conference. This fall, the member institutions of the Mid-American Conference, as well as the conference office itself, will implement a first-of-its-kind conference-wide diversity and inclusion plan. The plan calls for an internship program at each school in the conference office with the goal of identifying and training the next generation of a diverse set of coaches and administrators. Also being implemented this year will be a diversity and inclusion mentoring program with the purpose of assisting in the professional growth and development of administrators already on staff. This program will provide learning opportunities and professional development opportunities both within each individual department and across the conference. The conference will hold its inaugural Diversity and Inclusion Summit this winter, in which, which we bring together our membership and experts from across the enterprise of higher education and intercollegiate athletics to focus on supporting and facilitating the growth of a diverse set of students participating in athletics and coaches and administrators leading the enterprise. I should also note that a focus on diversity and inclusion is not a new focus for the Mid-American Conference. Let me remind you that the past two winners of the Award for Diversity and Inclusion from the NCAA and the Minority Opportunities Athletic Association have been Northern Illinois University and Bowling Green State University. I'm not sure that many of you are aware of the individuals who represent the conference on several critical NCAA committees. University of Toledo Director of Athletics Mike O'Brien is our representative to the NCAA Council. He has also been appointed to serve on the Council Coordination Committee. University at Buffalo President Dr. Satish Tripathi is the conference's representative to the NCA Board of Directors and was also just recently appointed to the NCA Board of Governors, which is essentially the executive committee of the various NCAA presidential groups. Both individuals do an outstanding job of representing the interests of the students, coaches, and member institutions of the Mid-American Conference. An issue I believe will be at the forefront during the coming months is focused on transfers, both undergraduate and graduate. Transfer regulations should be grounded in what is best in the best academic interests of the student. Data shows that students in general transfer more often than students who participate in athletics. However, there are sports which, in which transferring has become almost routine. For instance, in men's basketball, we know that 40% of men's basketball players transfer by the end of their sophomore season. The data also show that when a student participating in athletics transfers, their chances of graduating decreases. One area where I believe we must implement change as soon as possible is with the regulation that requires a student athlete to seek a release from their current institution before he or she can accept financial aid from another institution. If a student wants to transfer, then they should have the ability to do so with no interference. However, the question of whether a student should put in a year of residence before being able to compete should be based on what the data tells us. More information is necessary before we can answer that question. I also believe consideration should be given to making transfer rules consistent across all sports, unless there is data to suggest otherwise. 
And regarding graduate transfers, I continue to push the idea that a school that accepts a graduate transfer should be held accountable for that student in some academic metric, be it the APR or something else, and the institution should have to commit to two years of financial aid, regardless of whether the student athlete stays for two years. The NCAA Football Oversight Committee is closely examining a 14-week season and the preseason practice calendar, and both are closely linked. Currently, we have a combination of 13 and 14-week seasons, depending on how the calendar falls. This year is a 13-week season, with the next 14-week season occurring in 2019. Having 14 weeks to play 12 games provides greater spacing for games and gives you greater flexibility in scheduling, helping to reduce the schedule compression issues which take place in a 13 games season or 13 week season. However, the recent elimination of two a day practices and the lengthening of the preseason practice calendar to facilitate the 29 practice opportunities has complicated this issue. No one is anxious to see preseason camp open on a regular basis in July. Currently, 29 preseason practices are permitted, and if that number remains the same, I doubt we will see a 14-week season become the standard. If the number is reduced, say to 26 or 25 or 27, perhaps we might see some movement. And while a number of Mid-American conferences do not utilize all 29 practices, they do speak to the fact that they enjoy having the opportunity to use all of them if necessary. This will be an interesting debate in the months to come. I would like to thank the many fans from our member institutions. I appreciate the passion, integrity, and energy you bring, and thank you on behalf of our students, our coaches, and administrators. We truly value your contributions to the success of our programs and what you mean to Maction. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that life is a journey, not a destination. That is, in fact, what a football season is, a journey filled with challenges and opportunities, tedium and drama, sorrow and joy. The season will provide a lot of opportunity for self-discovery and growth for the students. And this is, in fact, the beauty of intercollegiate athletics and why it fits in and belongs as part of the higher education enterprise. Good luck to our students, our coaches, and our fans. The March to Detroit and the Marathon Mid-American Conference Championship game, the March to the CFP and the New Year's Six Bowl games, and in fact, to all the bowl games is on now. Ken, I'll be w glad to answer some questions. Sure, we'll go ahead and move to our question and answer uh, session right now. Both myself and Megan will have a uh, wireless mic. As you do have the microphone, please state your affiliation and name and we'll take questions. Uh, Jason Arkley, the Athens Messenger. Uh, John, you, you kind of touched on this in your speech, but the, the challenge of coming up with a 14-week set schedule year to year, college football in general across the nation, uh, what are the major challenges to making that a reality besides getting everyone to agree on the necessary number of practice days leading yeah. into a season? Well, I, I, I think the biggest issue will be the number of practice opportunities that are necessary. Um, and as we play with that, that will determine. You know, one of the changes that occurred this year is we don't count walkthroughs as a practice opportunity. If we discover our coaches are able to use walkthroughs as meaningful activities for the kids and we can utilize those, that may help alleviate or reduce the need uh, to, to be at 29. So if we can manage those, um, I think there's a reasonable chance we can get there. Uh, you know, we need to look at things like how many acclimatization days we need. We're looking at days off. You know, it's interesting, when you talk to our coaches, they were already building in those things already. Uh, and so I think it's, this year will be a great test tube, quite frankly, for what we're going to look at going forward. And it'll give the chance coaches a great chance to reflect on what is necessary, what is possible, and we'll see what we come up with. Good morning, Commissioner. John Wagner, Toledo Blade. Uh, you, you did not touch much on the bowl situation. Can you update 
on the league's bowl situation? Has the carousel finally stopped spinning there? Where, where do you see it going in the immediate future? Well, we're into year four of a six-year, essentially, cycle. And so we're a couple years out from seeing a new set of bowl games. Discussions, initial discussions have started on what the future looks like. Uh, we don't know what that is. Um, I feel pretty good about the situation we're in. We have some wonderful longstanding partners with our friends in Mobile, with our, our ESPN affiliation of Bulls, um, and possibly there may be others that come online down the road. Uh, my sense is we'll be positioned to have four, five, six primary Bulls moving forward. Uh, Elton Alexander with the Plain Dealer. Two questions. Um, you talking about the coaches and going on the field. You said they're subject to immediate 15-yard penalty. Why don't you just whack them and give them a 15-yard penalty when they go out on the board instead of making it, you know, a, a uh, judgment call? P perhaps I was too polite. It's no <laughs> longer a judgment call. They cross the white into the field of play to uh, – argue a call or non-call, that's subject to, that flag's supposed to be thrown. So it's um, not subject to it. I would urge you, where's Bill, Bill, Bill Carroll is here, <laughs> our, our coordinator of officials. Okay. Feel free to visit with Bill, and he can probably explain much clearer than I can. No, I just took what, what but, you, you know, said. You said subject, yeah. so I took that to mean it was. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not black, it's not gray anymore. Right. You right. enter the field of play, a flag is to be thrown. And then on, on the subject of bowls, I mean, at what point do you start cutting back? I yeah. mean, with the five and fives or yeah. 500 teams and teams that really yeah. don't deserve to go to a bowl game, when do you start cutting back and making it more meaningful? Yeah. The national discussion or our other conferences we interact with, uh, there has not been interest in moving off the six and six deserving team mark. We broached the subject, or are we interested in looking at seven and five as what that mark is? Nationally, there's no interest in moving off of that. Um, my sense is we'll try to manage it in such a way that limits the need to have five and seven teams into the pool. I think the last couple of years we've had two or three teams and that those five and seven teams, their ability to play into that has been linked to academic performance. Um, my sense is that's where we're, we're, we're going and we'll continue to go. Beyond that, I don't know that I could speculate any further. Yes, uh, Mark Gaughan, Buffalo News. Another scheduling question. The crossovers, are they s written in pencil over the next four or five years and then year to year you adjust or is it a year to year thing? And then secondly, is there any, uh, there, is there any discussion at all about weighting them, you know, uh, yeah. to try to make it, uh, s try to make an attempt to make it uh, even? Um, there is no attempt to weight them. Uh, we are currently in discussions for what the next cycle of schedules will look like. Uh, as you notice right now, we do our crossovers kind of on two-year cycles. Uh, what we're discussing right now is the concept of let's ensure we do something so that every student athlete who plays football has a chance to play every team in the Mid-American Conference. So it would put it on a, we'd end up with an eight year cycle if we move towards that. Uh, we have not finalized on that. We're looking at that right now. Uh, stay tuned. Commissioner Cameron Fields, the Post Athens. Uh, you talked about the diversity and inclusion plan. Uh, what kinds of things are you looking to have in that plan as well as at the summit that you talked about in the winter? Well, most of it is institutionally based. So each institution, uh, from an undergraduate or graduate perspective, will have an intern, at least one intern, each semester. It can be an administrative intern. It can be a coaching intern. And so they'll be immersed in all the things staffs do, whether coaching or administratively. Plus, they'll be engaged in some conference-wide activities. We will bring them at various times to conference events and meetings. Uh, from a mentoring program, we'll take administrators currently on staff, assign them a mentor. They will also be engaged in conference-wide activities, be brought to conference events and activities. 
Uh, yes, um, Robert Cobb from the Inscriber Digital Magazine. I have a, two questions. Um, number one, you mentioned a lot of the past great players from the MAC as well as the present. For a conference its size, the Mid-America Conference, why do you feel that the MAC has been so successful in putting NFL quality talent into the league, and how do you see that going forward? Boy, that's a good question. You know, I think it speaks to having really good coaches who put together good staffs and they recruit well, and they either find talent or they find gems in the rough. The kids come in, they're well motivated, they have chips on their shoulders, they get ready to play, and they go out and perform. Uh, thank you. And the second question is this, is in reference to the bowl situation, is that obviously you have the, the big six bowls that's going on with the college football playoff. At some point, do you feel that, hypothetically, if a college football were, were to expand, do you feel that one day you can see a MAC team crashing um, the college football playoff championship? Sure hope so. We'll take one last question and then we will uh, pose for a picture with all of our head coaches. Hi, John. Evan Meyer from Mac Report Online. You mentioned something about transfers. Uh, I know in basketball, if a player had completed his four years and had graduated, and if he has that extra year, he can play as a postgraduate. Do you still see that within Mac schools that if, you gra if, if a person from one school has graduated, can come in and finish his uh, collegiate career at a Mac school? Yeah, I don't believe there's any conversation about eliminating the, the, the grad transfer exception. The question is, what is built around it? Right now, it's, it's the closest thing we have to free agency in college sports. And so we need to build some accountability into it, both for the institution, so they're held accountable for the academic progress of that student coming in, as well as the institution needs to you know, kind of say, we're going to commit to this financially. I think if we'll do those two things, it will help bolster that area. Well, at this point, that concludes our question and answer session. We will have Commissioner Steinbrecher available for more questions a little bit later on this afternoon. But at this point, we're going to ask all of our head coaches to gather with Commissioner Steinbrecher for a group photo. So I'm going to ask John to come down and stand on the floor in front of the podium. And then if we could have our Mac West coaches, three on the riser on the right, Three on the left, go ahead and let's uh, pose, and then we'll have our Mac East coaches uh, on the floor with John, and we'll pose for a group photo. All right. 